Take your Bibles, turn to Ephesians, if you would, Ephesians chapter 5. When you get there, back up just a little bit to Galatians. Some of the, uh, some of the verses that I've got in my mind, I don't have in my notes, I'm going to put them on the screen. And again, I, have, I don't know why God laid this on my heart to preach this. I don't, I don't know why. I've dealt with it. I've, ta I've taught on it, uh, both here and, you know, like on a Wednesday night or uh, maybe on a Watchman broadcast or doing Pastor Mike online. I've, I've taught on it, but I can't say I've ever really preached a message on it. But I think the aspect of which I'm taking it might be a might be a benefit to somebody this morning um, just as a precursor to what I'm going to preach on just in case you think this will never affect you there is a family that I know of they are good friends of ours good friends of our ministry their son who they have a family business. They raise their children up to be very close to their parents. Uh, homeschooled, solid King James family. They sent their son off to Bible college. While he was at Bible college, somebody introduced him to the idea that there were multiple gods other than Jehovah God. Gods like Odin, who is a Nordic god. They worship him up around Scandinavia, Norway. Uh, the German name for him is Wotan. But they introduced him to these multiple gods and the what's called the runic language those of you who know anything about lord of the rings you know about the runic language it is supposedly a magic language and there's magic symbolism in the letters themselves and then when you write things in runic language um, you are sort of putting magic spells on different things and so on anyway that's that's him now that's what he believes now and then, of course, he was introduced to drugs. And um, then his influence extended over to his younger sister, who was pulled into lesbianism, and then to drugs by way of her brother. And... Um, when it comes to things like that, we're not just dealing with alternative ways of thinking. We're not just dealing with alternative ways of, let's say, worshiping something. When it comes to things like that, we are dealing with evil spirits, devils. There's a reason why God wanted us to stay away from certain things. It's because God knows the devils that are behind certain things and he knows how dangerous they are and what God is doing by saying, don't do this, don't be a part of this. He's trying to protect you. Like a, like a parent who would who knows something about a family that lives down the road, and all of a sudden you make friends with their son or their daughter, and you're playing with them, and then all of a sudden they invite you into their house, and you're going in their house, and then you come home, your mama finds out about it, and she says, I don't want you ever going in that house again. Oh, mom, you just don't want me to have no fun. No, mom knows about that family. She knows what they do. She knows who they are. She does not want her children sitting in Sunday school class on Sunday 
sitting in the church service on Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, coming to Bible study on Wednesday night, and then being pulled away by a wicked family who lives down the road. Let's be honest. Let, let's have some adults raise their hand. If you knew of somebody lived down the street or the neighborhood from you that you knew had bad stuff and you went, that's why you went down there. Come on, raise them hands. All right. God will forgive the rest of you that are lying, all right? Uh, before we go to Ephesians 5, look in Galatians 3. Now, I want you to look at this verse here, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath what? Bewitched you. Does that word mean what you think it means? It does. Who hath bewitched you? That you should not obey the truth. The whole purpose behind what I'm going to preach you this morning is to warn you to not get involved in certain things because they will pull you away from the truth. I know it. Other families have found it out the hard way. They've lost children. Children that now as adults, want, don't, they want nothing to do with their mom and dad. Because their mom and dad still believe the Bible. They still worship the Lord. Their mom and dad does not approve of their lifestyle. Their mom and dad does not approve of their things that they do and the things they believe in, things they practice. And so now they, the, the children are at odds with the parents just like Jesus prophesied would happen. But he used that phrase, bewitched you. Let's see, wasn't there a TV show called that? And what it did was it popularized, I mean, we're talking about the 60s. It popularized the idea that witches were good and they did good things. And this witch there, Samantha, on the TV show, she was a good witch. She only did witchcraft to help other people or whatever. Let me tell you what God says about it. There is no such thing as good witchcraft. There, it doesn't exist. Well, Brother Mike, you don't know. You just haven't studied. There's, there's, white, there's white magic and black magic, and you just haven't studied it. Oh, yes, I have. I've studied it probably more than most people. And I'm telling you, there is no such thing as good or holy or God-approved witchcraft. No such thing. Now over in Ephesians. Chapter 5, verse 10. Let me see if I can get some context on this. Yeah, let's back up a little bit to verse. Boy, I'd... let's go to Genesis and work our way forward, all right? No. Look at verse 8. For you were sometimes darkness. Who remembers being in darkness? Say amen. But now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Um, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Then, he says in verse 10, he's not done with the sentence, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. There are things that God will accept and there are things that God will not accept. There are things that God will allow, things that God will not allow. Things that God will put up with, he'll tolerate. Things that he won't tolerate. And those things should be proven. Whether or not you should, 
You personally have the responsibility in your life to prove what is acceptable unto God, what is righteous in the sight of God. And people, over the years, I've heard it all. A guy at my Sunday school class when I was pastoring down here at Richwoods just had to throw it in. I mean, him and his wife, they came to the altar one service before we were done with the singing service, before the preaching ever started, because they got under conviction, and I went down and prayed with them. Boy, I mean, we had a service like you wouldn't believe. Six months later, I found out that he's going around to different people asking them, do you think it's okay if I drink a little bit here every now and then? Well, that was his problem before he got back in with the Lord was his drinking. And he's not asking me, he's not asking his pastor, he's not asking his mom and dad, his dad was a deacon in the church, he's not asking them, he's asking people that he knows would tell him, well, I don't have a, I don't think you ought to have, you, sh you know, it's no problem, you take a drink every now and then. And then he brings that out in Sunday school class one time, and he says, oh, I believe it's okay to do anything as long as it's in moderation. What Bible verse is that? So what he was doing was looking for excuses why he could go against the word of God and it'd be okay. By the way, he wasn't there too long after that. Why? Because he loved his drinking, he loved his alcohol more than he loved the word of God. So proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and, and then he said in verse 11, have no fellowship with the un fruitful works of darkness no fellowship but rather reprove them for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret let's ask God to open up our eyes and our ears this morning Again, I have no idea. I don't know of anybody in this church that's practicing witchcraft in their, in their closet. I don't know. I have no idea. But God wants me to preach this for some reason, and I'll just leave it up to God. Father, I love you. I thank you very much, God, for everything you've done for me, especially this week. I praise you, God, for your mercy, your goodness your help. Thank you, Lord, for these people that you've gathered here today, all the people that are gathering with us online. I pray, Lord, that you'd bless them in a mighty way. Father, I know the devil don't like preaching like this, and so, Lord, any number of things could go wrong. I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would just bless this message so that it's able to go forward, do that which you sent it out to you. We know your word never, ever returns to you void. It always accomplishes what you've sent it out to do. Father, we know our labor is never in vain in the Lord. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would bless what may be my worst effort ever in preaching. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless it as only you can. Father, my heart in this message is toward our young people. They're the targets. They're the target of all the devils. They're the target of evil people. They're the target, Lord, because the devil knows if he can trap them at a young age, Chances are he can keep them for life. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would open up the eyes of young people everywhere, Lord, that they could see the dangers that lie in some of the things that they may even be taught in the classroom of their school. Father, we know beyond a doubt that some of these things are even taught in churches. And Father, we pray, dear God, that you would open our eyes to the dangers of it. 
and keep us away from it. Lord, bless your word. Bless this message. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. He said, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Uh, the Bible teaches us that uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. So while we have our children here in church, bring them to Sunday school. Those of you that are online, you have your children there with you and they're watching. I love it when families come to visit and these little kids come up to me and they think I'm eight feet tall. Look, there's Pastor Mike. Wow, you're a celebrity. I'm going, why, yes, I am. Thank you very much. No, I love it when these, if you go look at the, the door to my office, it's full of pictures that children have drawn, some of them of me. Some of them don't do me quite that much justice, but that's okay. And I hang them on there. That's my badge of honor there. Is when I know the children are listening to that. That blesses me. So they'll come and they'll, or they'll gather at home or wherever it is they're gathering. They'll listen to the word of God preach. They'll listen to Sunday school lessons. They'll listen to Pastor Mike online. They'll listen to Watchman broadcast. They'll listen to everything I do. And yet you can be guaranteed. That the devil is seeking a way to get to your children some other way. What did Jesus say? The thief doesn't come in the doorway. He comes in some other way. And so with me, at a young age, it was comic books. Well, I used to love to read comic books. And the comic books themselves weren't too bad. I liked, it. I liked Superman and... Didn't really get much into Marvel comics that much, but I liked Superman a lot, and I liked The Flash, and just stuff like that. But it was the advertisements in those. Still waiting to get a dollar so I could buy a pair of X-ray specs. I never bought the pair of X-ray specs, but, but there was a whole one-page ad in just about every comic book I had, and it advertised a book Four children called The Magic Power of Witchcraft. And it was written by two high-ranking witches that I didn't know this at the time, but they lived down around Springfield, Missouri. And I've since done a little research into them. And buddy, I'll tell you what, these people were evil in their deeds. And they were writing a book specifically for young people to try to teach them how to get involved in witchcraft. And they would put things in the ad like, so easy, even a child could do it. And I'm going, well, I'm a child. I could do these things. And it was a draw on me who came to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday school, revival meeting, quarterly meetings. I was here hearing the gospel. And yet, subtly, the devil was attracting me, trying to pull me away with this nonsense. So be not deceived. What do you think is the point and the aim of, of all of these Marvel-based movies that feature people with telekinetic powers? Do you know what telekinesis is? It is the supposed ability that you have to be able to move things with your mind. You're, so you're Luke Skywalker and you see your sword, your lightsaber way over there and you can't reach it because you're fighting off whatever guy and so you stick your hand out and your mind brings you your sword and then, and then you win. That's telekinesis. Did you know that that doesn't actually work? Did you know your brain, your mind does not have the ability to move things just with brain power? Do you know what that is that's doing that? That is a devil. Amen. Did you know that they have these people on there that supposedly can read your mind and they know all your thoughts and all of that junk? Did you know that you do not have with your brain the ability to read somebody's mind? 
Now you might be able to tell by their face what's going on, but you cannot read their mind. You know what that is? That's a devil that gives them that power. The force in Star Wars is nothing but devil powers given to both the bad and the good. Oh, there's the good guys who use the force. And then there's the bad guys who use the force. And they use the good side of the force. Let me tell you something. There's nothing good about it. It is a massive setup. Galatians chapter 5. Turn there. Turn back to a Galatians. By the way, these are directly tied in as being opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. Do you believe that when a person is saved, born again, Bible believing, that God endows them with certain gifts that we call the fruit of the Spirit? Do you believe that? Say amen. Did you know that in that list of the fruit of the Spirit, not one of them is the ability to control people with your mind? Not one of them. Not one of them is the ability for you to be able to speak words and cause money to just appear right in front of you. Did you know that in all of those fruits of the Spirit, not one of them has anything to do with just speak it and you shall be healed. It had nothing to do with that. But that's what you're told. By that Trinity Broadcasting Network crowd and a, bunch of, and a bunch of churches in this area. That's what you're told. That's what you're meant to believe. Joel Osteen will teach you that because you, you have, if you have the power that he has in his mind, you'll be able to shape the world around you and everything will go your way and everything will be positive and you'll never have a bad day. And if you have a bad day, it's your fault because you didn't think all the right positive thoughts. Did you know that has nothing to do with the fruits of the Spirit? So here are the things that God told us to stay away from. Galatians chapter 5, verse, this, by the way, he follows them up, this list up with the fruits of the Spirit. He says in Galatians 5, 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. In fact, let me, let me just share this with you. We used to have a little a magazine that would, that would come to us. We could order it through the scholastic books. You all know what I'm talking about, scholastic books? Books you order while you're at school. And one of them was a, a magazine called Dynamite Magazine. It used to come out in the 70s. And there was an art, and there was a girl when I was in sixth grade that I was madly in love with. She never would look at me, Cubby. I don't know why. But I reading in this magazine that you have powers of with your mind and you can force people into doing things with your mind. And so it told me like if you concentrate and focus on somebody long enough, they'll turn around and look at you. So I said, George, I'm gonna try this out. So we're sitting in like study hall or something like that one time, and I just stared at her. You know, that's a real turn on to girls. That's And you know what? Sure enough, 45 minutes later, she turned around and looked at me. I'm going, it works. Your mind don't have that power. Idolatry, verse 20. Witchcraft. Witchcraft. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies. False doctrines, doctrines that are not taught in the Bible. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. He said, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot practice witchcraft and be born again. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. The God of witchcraft is not the God whose son is Jesus Christ. 
You cannot serve both. You cannot be a born-again, Bible-believing. And by the way, the other Bethel Church out in Redding, California, they've got people that are part of that church that believe that. Holy witchcraft, holy yoga, things like that. I'll get to that in a little bit. Now, why do you suppose God doesn't want you practicing or being a part of these things? Why is it that God warned Israel, when you go into the land, I don't want you doing these things? Why do you think God did that? Why do you think God was so adamant about this that he said, if you do those things, the sentence is death. When God said, thou shall not suffer a witch to live. He was serious, wasn't he? If you were found practicing witchcraft in the camp, in the wilderness, you were to be taken and you were to be killed. God said, I will not have that. Why? Why do you think that is? It is because as a witch, you are calling upon forces that are nothing more than we would call them unclean spirits, familiar spirits, devils, gods with a little g, fallen angels, whatever the term is, that's what you're calling upon. And when somebody practices witchcraft and they are in your midst, if you are born again, I guarantee you your spirit will know that they're around. How many of you have ever experienced something like that? You just know it. Some, something ain't right. And it's because they have devils all over them like bees, like flies flying around them. The stench of their wickedness has these devils all around them. And you get around them and you've got the Holy Spirit in you, dwelling in you, giving you discernment. And something's telling you that person's not right. So turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Let's run through it. There's a list here. Isn't that interesting? You're, if you count these, there's nine fruits of the Spirit, and there's nine of these. See the contrast? God gives you one set of nine. The devil gives you the other nine. And again, no man can serve two masters. You want to do this stuff? You want to practice these things? You want to participate in these things? You want to read books and sit and watch cartoons and movies and graphic novels and all of that junk? You want to sit and fill your mind with this stuff? All of this is intended to draw your mind away from the truth that is in the Word of God. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Um, verse 9. God said, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, Thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Now, here's what God was saying. Those people in these nations are already practicing this stuff. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 6, what, what communion hath light with darkness? None. What concord hath Christ with Belial, it means the devil, none. So is it possible for you to worship Christ and worship the devil at the same time? No, you are either gonna hold to the one and despise the other or hate the one and love the other. But you cannot be both. You cannot participate in both. So these are the practices that God said 
don't do. Don't have anything to do with them. And believe it or not, I, how many of you ever heard of a book called um, The Aquarian Conspiracy? Anybody ever heard of that book? I got a copy of it years ago, and I decided to read it cover to cover. You know what I found out, Cubby? It was written by a New Ager, a woman who was basically telling the world, we're the New Age, this is what we're doing, and you can't stop us. She said, we are in positions of government, we are in financial institutions, we're running banks, we are running uh, big businesses, we are in uh, colleges and universities all across the world and across the country, we are in high schools, we are in elementary schools, we are in kindergarten, we are in the libraries of your children, we are, in, we are behind pulpits, we are in seminaries. That's what she said. And sure enough, Brother George, I start reading this book and you know what I figured out? I figured out that the things that she was saying that the New Age was a part of and, and some of the phrases that the New Age uses, those are the same phrases that are being used by people like Rick Warren and countless others who have left the Word of God and are going after the big money and the big crowd. Seems like to me some of these guys, I'll just say it like it is, I think some of these guys sold their soul to the devil. God says, when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. So number one, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Now, we have this historic idea, and it's, I believe it, that they would take their infant children and there would be this big brass god called Molech and they would build a fire around and in Molech and he's sitting there like a like a pot belly stove almost he's full of hot he's scalding hot and they would take their babies and cast them onto that fire and they would scream as they seared and roasted in that fire i want to tell you something you got to have a devil in you to be able to do something like that Likewise, you've got to have a devil in you to take a surgeon's scalpel and just rip a baby to shreds and throw the body parts away in a plastic bag or sell them to some company. That's wicked. But I think it involves more than that. I mentioned the other Bethel church. The, I call it the anti-Bethel church. It's the Bethel church out in Redding, California. And I've had people who've, who've lived out there who've called me and they said, this whole town's crazy because of that church. I'm going, well, of course, it's California. But they have in their church, I'm not kidding you. If you want to go through this initiation that they set up for you so you can get the Holy Ghost, they will have people on both sides of a line and they'll form their hands over the top Touching hands over, you know, making a tunnel. And they call it a fire tunnel. And each participant will be going through this fire tunnel. Supposedly when they come out on the other side, they've been transformed. They've been born again. They have the spirit in them now. And I'm going, they're making them pass through the fire. Just like God said, don't do that. But then we have, how many's ever seen anything like this before? Corporations, big businesses will have retreats led by new age guides that will train people and, and, and 
tell them that big, you know, big sales and big money is a matter of your mind. And if you could just train your mind, you can make big money and big sales and nothing can stop you. And we're going to teach you how to literally walk on fire as proof that you can change your mind and change how you do things and be successful. And they literally pass people through the fire. Now, let me tell you something, just as a matter of common sense. If you put a hot coal on the bottom of your foot, it will burn real bad. What does it take for a person to walk across hot coals and them not be burnt? That's devils. That's devils. God said, don't do it. God said, don't do it. There should not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. God said, don't do it. By the way, we have... We go to Bible camp every year. We don't do this at Bible camp. But there are teen camps that do this. They're teaching teenagers to do this stuff. Then he mentions using divination. What is divination? Fortune telling. It is, watch this now, it is someone who is trying to gain unknown knowledge or unknowable knowledge through supernatural means. Now let me give you God's side of it. Peter said, we have a more sure word of prophecy. So if anybody here Ever wants to know what God said, what should you do? Read the Bible. Are we agreed on that? Just read your Bible. Well, what about people that, oh, I've been given a word of knowledge for you. Ooh. Say, okay, what chapter and verse is that? Because I don't believe anybody for anything, for any reason, except I see it in my Bible. Sola Scriptura. That's what separates us from the Catholic Church and from practically everybody else in the world. Is that if we're going to believe something of a supernatural nature, we're going to read it in our Bibles. And it's just, and the Holy Ghost then will then give us light on what that means for us and how it applies and so on and so on and so on. But there are various methods of using divination. Tarot cards. Now, I'm going to say something. Um, when I say card games... I'm not necessarily talking about playing Go Fish. But if you go to Walmart or go to some place that sells a lot of toys, you're going to find a lot of games that involve using cards. Card captors. Uh, give me some other ones. Anybody know? Magic the Gathering. Now, I'm not saying every one of them is bad. I'm saying that in many cases, they are a training ground for children to gain occult knowledge by way of using divination cards. Uh, palm reading. Derek, come here. Come here. You've been waiting on this. Come here, Derek. You ever had your palm red? No. Now your palm's red. I just had to do that. I'm sorry, Derek. <laughs> These are all forms of divination. 
They are trying to gain supernatural knowledge by some means of... Let me tell you something. The lines on your hand have nothing to do with who you are, where you've been, where you are now, and where you're going. Nothing. Then God said, here's, here's the list. Pass through the fire, use a divination, an observer of times. What is an observer of times? Astrology. Do not, do not try to gain discernment on who you are as a person by looking up your sign. I was born in born on May 30th, that makes me a Gemini. Did you know that doesn't matter or amount to a hill of beans to me? Do you, know, do you understand what the Bible says the stars are? The stars are angels, either of a good kind or a bad kind. And what you're doing with astrology is that you are asking the stars to guide you, to tell you. There's even songs written about that. A star to guide me. There are people who believe that the lineup and the position and the joining together or the whatever of the stars determines their fate. And I'm telling you, it's a lot. And what people are doing is that they are learning when God said, in fact, let me read the verse to you. Turn to Deuteronomy 4. Let me tell you what you're doing with an observer of times or an astrologer. Let me tell you what you're doing. Deuteronomy 4, 19. The Bible says, Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, and shouldest be, now watch this, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them. Do you know what that means? It means that whatever the stars tell you to do, that's what you do. And instead of you looking to the stars for guidance, why don't you look to the one who made the stars? Somebody say amen. Yeah, come on. Those stars will lie to you. They are devils. And God said, notice what he said. Should us be driven to worship and serve them. That's what worship means. It means that whatever they say do, you do. Don't get, don't get involved in that. Don't follow that. God said don't do it. Because those stars have no say in your life whatsoever. And the Lord, anyway. Then he said, use a divination or observant of times or an enchanter. What is an enchanter? Someone who uses enchantments. What are enchantments? Huh? Spells. They are phrases repeated over and over and over and over and over again. Incantations is another form of that. Incantations, enchanters. It is the belief that power words in a certain language spoken often enough will produce the things. I had a friend years ago that he went to a, um, a United Pentecostal church. United Pentecostals don't believe in the Godhead. They don't believe in the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. And they believe that you are not saved unless you speak in tongues. And he went to that church and he didn't know any better. And they, he, he fell under conviction during the message. That was good. And he went down to the altar thinking he was just going to confess his sins to God and be saved. 
Well, he gets down to the altar and he confesses his heart to God. And, and he believes he's saved, but they tell him he's not saved yet. That what he needs to do now is speak in tongues. So he said, well, I, I, I don't know how to do that. And they said, well, we do. We're going to teach you how to do it. Now, excuse me. But on the day of Pentecost, who was it that taught the disciples how to speak in those languages? The Holy Ghost did. So my thinking is, if it's real tongues, you don't need a trainer or an instructor or a script. You just do, God just puts it in you. But he, they said, now here's what you do. Now, hold your hands up in the air. So he held like, like this. And they said, now say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They said, say it again. Hallelujah. Say it again. Hallelujah. Say it again. Hallelujah. Say it again. Louder, faster, faster. Hallelujah. 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 Woo! He got it. Now, what did, um, what did Jesus have to say about that? By the way, You go to any bookstore and go to the adolescent section or the teen section. Probably 80% of the books written for adolescents has to do with witchcraft, enchantments, magic, sorcery, wizardry, fortune telling. They are instructing and teaching children. Lisa and I, one time, we was at the mall years ago, back, back when they had malls, remember those? And we passed by the bookstore that was at the mall, and we could not believe it. We went in that store, and right there at eye level, and I bought the book. I, I don't know if I, I still have it somewhere, but it was uh, Spellcasting for Girls. It was pink, you know, like girls Hope's age would like. And it was written for her age to teach her how to spell cast, how to recognize her familiar, a familiar spirit, how to get in contact with a familiar spirit. It's teaching hardcore witchcraft to a 19 year old child, including teaching a 10 year old girl love spells. Uh, by the way, what you see on the right is an example of the kind of cards I'm referring to. Divination cards or role-playing games where you become characters and many of them are wizards, witches, enchanters and so on. What did Jesus have to say about repetitions in our prayers? When you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. The prophets of Baal, what were they doing when they were being asked to call down fire from Baal? They kept repeating their prayers over and over and over again, cutting themselves, blood everywhere. And yet, what did Elijah do? Prayed one time. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. He didn't say, repeat it over and over and over and over again, did he? Pray it. And believe what God said. That's power, amen. But what do we hear in our churches now? especially in the praise and worship service. The repetition 
of the, of the chorus over and over and over and over and over because it's as if if we keep singing this, then God will hear us and he'll come down. Excuse me, God heard you the first time. Then he said, an enchanter or a witch. A witch, in fact, turn your, um, turn your Bibles to Galatians, if you would. I'll never forget when I was in college, I was working at a shoe store, Payless Shoe Source, and a woman came in and she had a very large pentagram necklace on. And I didn't know then what I know now, but I recognized that. I told the manager who, him and his wife were uh, Pentecostal Christians, they were good people. I told the manager after she left, I said, did you see that necklace that lady was wearing? He said, yeah, what was that? I said, she was a witch. She's a practicing witch. You know what that pentagram means? You want to know? Does anybody want to know what the pentagram means? If you don't want to know, I'll let you go home. You want to know, Chris? Turn to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? By the way, if your Bible don't say Lucifer, get another Bible. Verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, number one, I will ascend into heaven. Number two, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Number three, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Number four, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Number five, I will be like the Most High. There's five things here. That's what that pentagram stands for. Bible reveals everything. It also represents what they call the elementals. The force, in other words. Earth, air, fire, and water. Each one in having its own symbol, its own plan, its own cardinal direction, its own season, its own everything.